Thanks, Michael. Um, so I just realized that I did not put in a slide about who I am or how to contact me. So um, my name's Anita Kuno, and my uh, Twitter nickname uh, and my IRC uh, nickname is Antea, A-N-T-E-A-Y-A, -E if you want to find me on IRC or Twitter. You're more than welcome to do that. Uh, as Michael said, uh, I work for HP and uh, I work uh, upstream on OpenStack. So we're going to talk about um, when you are a developer contributing to OpenStack and some of the common trip hazards. Uh, so this isn't a, a getting started with OpenStack talk. Um, but in the, in the infra channel, uh, where I try to help out with, uh, although I'm currently on another project right now, uh, but there are a lot of common questions uh, that, that people kind of trip over, and we try to document them as best as possible, uh, but they're either hard to document, uh, it's a brand new feature, uh, or it's, it's something that even though we document it, people don't seem to understand what we're trying to convey. So uh, this, the title for this talk actually came from uh, somebody who is a very prolific uh, contributor and uh, he was looking for something and we showed him the URL and said, here it is, here's the full package. And his response was, how did I not know this? So um, thank you to Hubcap uh, for giving me the title of the talk. Um, so some of the, 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 the it's basically a, a grab bag of things that might help you uh, as you contribute to OpenStack. Um, so just in terms of getting a sense of who's uh, in the room, um, we've established that, that the majority of people know what OpenStack is. Is that correct? We know what OpenStack is. Okay. How many people have contributed a patch to OpenStack, have offered a patch? Okay. About, about a third, maybe half of the room. Okay, so some of the things might be helpful if you do decide to get started with OpenStack as a contributor, and some of the, the things that I mentioned, uh, if you are uh, or have contributed, might be helpful as you go along. Um, so I'll start with an OpenStack infrastructure overview. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I will warn you this slide is kind of bright. So um, there's one thing I will say. I, I used this slide yesterday, and <laughs> it, was, it was right yesterday. John, John's already ahead of me on this one. Um, I thought, you know, last week when I was making it and I was enjoying putting everything together and so on and making sure everything lined up, and I thought, oh, it's perfect. This will be the slide I can use for a couple of months anyway. So I used it yesterday, and it was correct, and today it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> and you will see that there are three Jenkinses represented. And yesterday we had three Jenkinses, and today we have five. <laughs> um, are they serving and, and running jobs? They, they are operating within normal parameters. Yay! So uh, that's the speed of how fast our uh, test infrastructure team works. Um, morning Australia time, evening uh, North American time, uh, there was a, a problem between uh, Jenkins and NodePool in terms of communication. And so the problem was assessed and, and Jim was up early this morning and I was watching the conversation evolve. And so the assessment in terms of what was happening and, and, and so on. And the uh, evaluation was that our Jenkinses were having to deal with too many jobs at once, which is a common problem uh, that we, we keep hitting. Uh, and so the solution was to spin up two more Jenkinses. So between, I guess that was probably about six o'clock this morning, I saw that conversation starting, and now, what are we, three? Uh, so what is that, eight hours, seven, eight hours? Um, we have been able to spin up two Jenkinses, get them configured, and have them have node pool serving them VMs, and actually have them so that they're now able to run jobs. So 
Uh, I thought I'd share that with you. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. Um, so anyway, we'll go over this, this graphic quickly. Uh, so you, uh, on your local development as a contributor, as a contributor, you are the uh, red oval. Uh, you uh, push up your patch to Garrett. Uh, are we f all familiar with what Garrett is and what it does? Wonderful, yes, okay. Uh, it's essentially a fancy Git repo. So it has the canonical uh, Git repos of all of the OpenStack projects uh, that Garrett knows about, and there's some, some fancy things at the front uh, which we can configure in terms of uh, how do merges happen and who has permissions to do various things. So, and uh, then Garrett communicates with Zool, Zool communicates with Gearman. Uh, Gearman communicates with all of the Gearman workers on Jenkins, uh, and we uh, put in the Gearman layer so that we could have more Jenkinses, and because we have that, the decision from spinning up two more Jenkinses to actually having them uh, took a matter of hours. Uh, so we already had that in place. Node pool uh, is a tool uh, that was uh, written internally uh, in order to be able to uh, serve up VMs. So node pool has VMs, those are the stars. It is assessing how many spare VMs are available in reserve uh, for each Jenkins. I'm seeing some interest in this, so I'll go into it in just a little tiny bit more detail. Um, node pool once every 24 hours uh, takes all of the current dependencies, downloads them all, and, cache, and uh, caches that, uh, creates a snapshot, and then uses that snapshot for the next 24 hours for any VMs that it spins up. In a 24-hour period, we probably spin up uh, 400, 500 VMs. More than that? 500 VMs in 24 hours? We'll go with that. I'm probably wrong, but let's use that as a figure. Um, and then uh, 24 hours later, node pool goes through its whole uh, session again. Node pool will serve up um, VMs in reserve for each Jenkins, and so now it does five. Uh, and then when Jenkins actually has an assignment and a job to run, it will uh, s go into its uh, reserve and it will select a VM and it will attach itself and, and run the job. And then the logs get moved over, the VM gets, uh, goes down, node pool will spin up something else. Uh, and then the, um, the message that it contains the URL for the logs goes back through Gearman to Zool to Garrett and gets attached uh, as a comment to the patch that it just tested. Does that make sense or have I just, have I been very confusing? Okay, that makes sense. Okay, great. So that is uh, how our infrastructure, basically that's our workflow and knowing that as a uh, contributor, that will help you um, because when something happens to your patch or when you get a comment back or when you go looking for the logs uh, and the logs are lost or missing, that knowing that might help explain why some of those things are taking place. Uh, Status.openstack.org will be very helpful uh, as a URL for developers because there's many handy tools uh, on status.openstack.org uh, that helps you to assess what's going on. If you know what's going on with the current infrastructure in terms of flow, then you understand where your patch fits in. And if you're experiencing, if, if some logs came back and you don't understand the message, it may help you understand if there's a problem with your patch or, or assess what's happening with the infrastructure system. Uh, Zool has a status page uh, on, on uh, status.openstack.org, uh, and that's what it looks like. And unfortunately, that's pretty small, and I'm sorry about that. But hopefully, uh, oh, I don't have any clock on my, on my slideshow. Can you wave to me when I'm done? Thanks. Um, so basically, uh, if we'll, we'll take a look at it this way. Uh, there are, uh, you'll see three columns. Uh, the two columns to get used to are, are the check column and the gate column. So this is the status. When I took this screenshot, these were all of the patches that were going through the check test um, pipeline. So all of these, all of the ones with uh, green dots, the, the tests were passing so far. The one with the red dot, there had been a failure. Uh, at some point on a voting test, 
and, uh, but all of the tests hadn't p completed running. So once all the tests completed running, then the logs go back to the patch, and then the developer is able to assess whether they've got more than one failure or just one failure because all of the logs will be available to them. Uh, in the gate, uh, column, you'll see a line, and uh, we call that a subway line, Jim? Uh, Is that what? Yeah, it's sort of a subway graphing. It's based on the, 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 the subway graphing uh, the big K program for visualizing gates. Okay. All right. So it's a, it's a subway graph because the gate queue is the queue that you have to pass just before you're merged. And the way the algorithm works is that rather than testing each patch individually, so if we had three patches, if we were doing them individually, two would have to wait while we test this patch. And if we merge it, then we have to uh, spin that up using the, the just merge patch to test the next one. And so what the algorithm is, and it's Zool that takes care of this algorithm, uh, what the algorithm is is that we test all of the patches together and as long as they continue to pass, they stay in that queue. And there's, um, the, the, the terminology is the nearest non-failing item. And so as soon as there is a failure, and, and see this branch here right at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it or not, yes? Um, the, the, the test just below this one, which is cut off on the slide, um, would be failing, which is why we have the branch. So the one that's failing, it still has to run because those logs have to be returned to the developer so that the developer can assess what's happening with their patch and why it didn't get merged so that they can uh, do what they need to do to fix that. But the one below it would still be in the subway line because it's passing. So what our algorithm does then is that it has a way of assessing which um, patches have the ability to merge because the tests are passing and which ones don't and as soon as it recognizes that it doesn't it moves it aside and and has a specific line the subway line tells you which patches are likely to be merged and which ones have moved aside because of a test failure does that make sense Okay, so knowing how to see that helps you understand if you're looking at your patch, let's say your patch is the third from uh, the bottom, uh, it, knowing whether or not your, your patch has a chance of passing. Sometimes, um, especially if you're in a time crunch, you need to know uh, as soon as your test is failing so that you can make an adjustment. Oh goodness, okay. I only have five minutes left, so I'll move along. Um, with Garrett, there's some things to do with Garrett. As soon as you uh, clone your Git repo, because you're going to be developing on it, my recommendation is obviously take a look at your Git config and make sure that you've got your name and your email in there, because a Gar uh, Garrett will care, uh, because both of those things are needed for your patches. Uh, use Git review. Uh, somehow or other, there's a small pocket of developers who are not using Git review, and so if somebody, if you're talking to somebody and they recommend that you don't use Git review for submitting patches to OpenStack, don't do that. Use Git review because what's happening is that their patch is being pushed to Garrett, so Garrett knows about it, but Garrett doesn't know about the parent. So the patch will never get merged because Garrett doesn't know about the parent and how they got this patch into Garrett. They couldn't have done it th through using Git review, uh, and so these people will never get their patches merged because they didn't use the tool that, that we provide um, using Git review. Git review S sets up your remotes. Um, uh, so as soon as you get a repo, run Git review S, and that creates remote branches that know about Garrett, where our Garrett is. Uh, and so that you can uh, submit patches to that. You can download a patch using git review hyphen D and the patch number. And you can also select um, a specific patch set as well. But you have to have those um, Garrett branches in your uh, git repo in order to be able to run that. Don't use draft. 
draft is an option uh, with Git review, don't use it. Uh, and the reason for that is that people use it in order to keep something between a couple of developers or have permissions for just a few people to evaluate the patch uh, in the initial stages. But further on down the line, when you're ready to merge it, uh, there's problems with uh, merging, rebasing, and some of the other uh, Git actions if the first patch set was a draft. And so uh, we continually have problems with this. So now we're at the point, uh, draft is still an option, but we're recommending that you don't use it. Use work in progress instead. So when you use the GUI uh, for uh, Garrett, for each review, there'll be an opportunity, there'll be a work in progress button. The work in progress button is a signal to reviewers that you're still working on your patch. You want people to look at it, or it's a way to save it. Um, so that you push it up uh, to Garrett, it, you have it as a work in progress, and then should something happen to your local development environment, you can just pull down the patch and keep working on it. Uh, git.openstack.org is where all, all of our repos are. Um, Elastic Recheck uh, is uh, one of the tools that we use to evaluate uh, how our gate is failing and what bugs our gate is failing on. So if, uh, if, if there are jobs consistently failing on the same bug, um, we have the capability of, of evaluating the logs and if we see a recognized bug, Elastic Recheck will leave a comment on your patch saying we think you hit this bug um, and, and here's some recommendations. The, the one thing I will encourage you to do that, it will tell you to use a, uh, a, a, um, a, a syntax recheck bug and the bug number uh, as a comment to your patch in order to make the tests run again. One of the things that we're finding in the community is people are doing that and they've got code that might actually be making the bug worse and people are forcing it in by using recheck no bug and so you finally, if it's an intermittent bug, if you run the test 10 times, you can get it into the code base but what you've done is you've made the bug worse. So if you keep hitting the exact same bug, please go through all of your code and see if you can edit it some way so that you're not hitting this bug and certainly make sure that you're not making that bug worse. Um, this is a graph that, on, that is on the Elastic Recheck site. Uh, and Elastic Recheck does not have a link to anywhere else. So uh, uh, Elastic Recheck is status.openstack.org slash Elastic hyphen Recheck. There's no link on the status page to get to Elastic Recheck, but if you know it, you can find it. Um, so uh, one of the items on this is a, is a graph of gate failure rates, and it's a little hard to read right here, um, but that's how we're doing. Sometimes we have had up to 50% gate failure rate, and, and we're rarely down at zero, um, but uh, sometimes we can get as low as, as about uh, 12 to 15%. So seeing where we are with our gate failure rates, if you're pushing a patch and you're hitting a lot of problems with it, come on over to Elastic Recheck and see how the gate is doing. There might be a job that's having a problem with a dependency uh, or a requirement that changed versions. And no matter what you do to your patch, it's not going to pass. So come on over here, take a look, and see what's happening um, uh, at Elastic Recheck. Uh, there is another uh, gate status page, uh, and this is at uh, Not My Name's uh, website, and that's gate underscore status dot html. And you probably have about two minutes. Does John have two minutes? Maybe a little bit less. A little bit less? A minute and a half? So John is going to talk about this slide, which he created. Oh, sorry. Let me, let me give you a microphone. Hello. Anita asked me to go over what does this mean. Um, so there are notice in the bottom left hand or bottom right hand corner. There's a list of uh, six gate jobs that we have. Those are kind of small there, but those are six jobs that are run as a common, uh, pretty much common to just about every patch in any project. Uh, and these are specifically gate jobs. They have to pass before a, a patch can land. So the purpose of this is quite noble. Let's make sure that we have everything integrated uh, just fine. The problem is. Uh, sometimes there are some non-deterministic bugs that show up sometimes, and 
So the nice thing is that we've got Graphite hooked up onto uh, all of the Garrett stuff, and so we know or so we know how often things are passing and failing. So the thin lines that are kind of the stair steps coming across there, it's uh, bucketed into eight hour uh, time chunks and I think it's currently, it's a, it's a three week graph. So you can see that uh, we, we specifically calculate within this eight hour period, what was the past, uh, the percentage chance uh, that this was going to, or what, what was the actual computed uh, pass rate on here? So let's say, yeah, it's 85% pass rate or something like that. So then the bold, uh, the bold red line is really what was, is the interesting thing for me. And that is the fact that if you multiply those percentages together, uh, what, uh, what you have is these, um, if you have a perfectly good patch, let's, it doesn't matter what it is, but let's say it's perfectly good. It does everything right, there's no bugs in it, everything's good, and it's the top of the gate queue. Then at that point, uh, looking at the current pass patch chance, or the gate pass chances, you can calculate what's the likelihood that your patch is actually going to land. And that is what the bold orange line is. And you can see that sometimes it gets rather embarrassingly low. Uh, because the point is, if you've got six things there and each of those has a 95% pass rate, multiply that together and it's actually a shockingly low number of uh, what, that's, what the problem is, uh, what the pass patch chance is. And what's really bad, that's the thing at the top of the queue. If you remember from Anita's uh, thing earlier, and as of right now, you can see we've got a very deep queue of you know, over 50 things in the queue. So what's the likelihood that all 50, 49 things below, ahead of yours are going to patch, are going to pass, and basically you can see that it's not gonna happen without some sort of gate reset, which means it has to start everything over, um, which essentially goes into, you've got hours for your patch to land. The orange line that goes across there is the moving average uh, for one week, uh, I believe, yeah, one week moving average of that orange, that bold red line. Um, and then the, in the shaded at the bottom is the, uh, the current status of how many patches are in the gate. There's an average number of uh, things in the gate for that eight hour chunk, which you can see just over the last couple days, it kind of spiked up because they had the, they are working on fixing that because there's more Jenkins boxes now. Um, so that basically, I believe, is my time. Um, so thank you very much. And do I have time for questions? Uh, probably not. Okay, I don't have time for questions. Uh, if there is anything uh, that you would like to know about, uh, you can come and find me afterwards or at a break, uh, or I'm around all week uh, if there's anything I can help you with. Thanks very much.